So I just arrived in Brussels for the second edition of the DuckCon conference and I'm gonna take the opportunity to ask a few questions to the creator of DuckDB. Fact, it's very great to, to see you in person in this beautiful weather in Brussels. What was going on in your mind before the first comet of DuckDB? Yeah. Um, so DuckDB is of course uh, coming out of our research at the CWI, the Dutch Research Institute for Computer Science and Mathematics, and where I have been uh, working for the last 10 years. Um, and I've been working in a group uh, called Database Architectures. And in that group, you know, we do research on how data systems should be built, you know, maybe think a bit about the trade-offs that we face, the architecture, the general sort of experience. Um, and there was this interesting thing that happened when we started talking to some data practitioners, uh, specifically the R community, by the way, uh, who are very friendly and uh, I'm still really appreciative <laughs> that they were so nice to me. It turns out that they weren't using databases at all, right? Like they weren't, um, they were storing their, their data in CSV files. They were like, mm -hmm. some of them had like hand-rolled uh, data frame engines on top of like these things on, they had these data frames in memory, they were running stuff on that. And it was all pretty slow and limited because of, yeah, the way these engines were structured. Um, and they really didn't like to use databases. And I was really confused by that because I really love databases. And I thought, okay, the R people are working a lot with data. They're facing real data issues like stuff being too big. Why are they not using our stuff, right? And then we started thinking and said, okay, big first big problem is that pulling data between a database and your application program, in this case, an R shell where you maybe do analysis, way too slow. Like the client protocols of databases, you know, built in the 80s, have never been touched, uh, row-based, hardcore serialization stuff, not great. So we fixed that. And then we showed this to the R people and they said, yeah, this is better, but we still hate managing database servers because the way, you know, if you think about it, client server setup, like you're running your R thing, and then you're running your like database next to it. And that's uh, a, a setup issue. You know, this, you can make this work on your laptop maybe, but you want to send this script to somebody else and it won't run because, you know, they don't have the same setup and then they have to set it up and it's a nightmare to configure these things. Maybe we need to do something like SQLite where there is actually no database server, but the database is in process. It's a library, it's just linked to the thing. But for analytics, because SQLite is an amazing system, um, it doesn't do analytical workloads, it does transactional workloads. And that didn't exist. It turns out we invented a new, whole new class of database systems. It was the in-process analytics thing, which of course is good if you're doing research in this sort of thing. Um, so what we then did was we took uh, another database system and we hacked around in it to make a prototype. It was called MonoDB Lite. And the MonoDB Lite prototype was a in-process analytical database system, speak SQL, um, and kind of worked. It worked okay enough to get people excited about it. And so we, we, we put it out, uh, we, we promoted it a bit in the R community. If people started using it, people got excited, but we ran into some architectural issues there. Like, uh, for example, you know, if you're running in process, it's a much more harsh environment. You cannot like just exit the process if things go wrong because you're running in some, uh, somebody else's process. If you exit that, they're gonna be very unhappy with you. Um, you have a lot of uh, other requirements like this uh, where you know you cannot use certain APIs because they change some state in the program that the other thing also looks at like the, the locale or uh, the working directory. Like it's really trivial stuff, but it, it adds up and uh, taking all this out of an existing system proved to be quite hard. Um, and we also had reliability issues there. And I felt uh, encouraged to do whatever I thought was best. I decided that I'm gonna, uh, that I'm gonna start with Mark together uh, to build a, a new database system, which is a monumental undertaking. It doesn't happen very often and it doesn't ha it doesn't, it's not successful 99% of the time because it's a monumental undertaking. And it's actually not great for your career as a researcher because you disappear for five years, hacking around uh, and not writing papers, uh, which is what you're supposed to do. But we kind of knew that we wanted, like what we wanted, right? Because yeah. we had this prototype, we knew what was wrong with the prototype, so we knew how to differently um, yeah, there was kind of already product market fit. We had already seen that this is something that people get excited about. That was really encouraging. But of course, it was also really frustrating because getting back to where the prototype was yeah. took a long time because you start from scratch. 
you know so so you have you know like sql is a complex language um supporting like all these detailed sort of operators like was it was quite it was quite a lot of work and yeah mark and i basically did nothing else evenings weekends just hacking on DuckDB uh, for a couple of years. Um, and then we, I think we announced it in, maybe we open sourced it in 2019 and, and we got a lot of positive feedback, of course. I think also immediately when we announced it, there was also just a lot of positive feedback and people got excited. The, the design sort of the inspiration of DuckDB really came from talking to data practitioners. Yeah. So it, so to recap, it came from your, the, the Air community struggling with, you know, just local file. And anything to to work go uh, with database. Yeah, yeah. I and don't... so you end up making a database for that. We uh, <laughs> in a in a way, yes. Yeah. And I think I think it's kind of interesting because we made we this true. It's fair to say we made it for them. Indeed, we did kind of design it around these interactions with the R people. And uh, yeah, I think that's generally a good idea because yeah. you you know you you have a real problem to solve. You're not just designing into 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 thin air. Uh, they will tell you whether they like it or not. Um, and I'm still very thankful for that because like there were lots of people in that community that were willing to try the crazy stuff that we that we hacked together that was barely working and gave us like feedback and said, okay, this is really exciting or this doesn't work or... The thing is, uh, this kind of process is uh, sometimes missing in the academic world. Yeah, that's true. It's rare. Yeah, uh, it's a, it's, that's a good point. How is, why is that, why, why did we actually start going, talking to people about this? That's, that's, it's a bit of an accident, baby. It's not supposed <laughs> to happen. It's, a yeah. bit, maybe we were just weirdos. And, but for me, I always, you know, for me as a, as a researcher, my definition of success is not to write papers. It's to have impact. Yeah. And how do you have impact? Well, uh, especially in data systems research, you have impact by making systems. I mean, we have a Turing award. In, in computer science for Mike Stonebreaker, not because he writes amazing theoretical paper, but because he made, made systems like Ingress and Postgres. So I think in this particular space, it is actually, how should I say, it's actually required to, to, to see, you know, to make something that uh, will see widespread use in order to achieve impact. And that, that's exactly what we're doing.